Thanks everyone for joining. As we typically do, uh, just a quick intro of some of the other members here at uh, Austerity Private Wealth. Uh, once again, this is the first of our 2023 webinar series where we try to bring different educational topics, some financial, some planning based, some tax based. In this case, estate planning and having conversations with your, your loved ones. Um, I'll just reference an order of, of who I see on my screen. Jen Fisher, Sean Fascinella, Shane Fox, and then new to the team as of two months ago, Michael Venaria, uh, who is our most recent addition. He's a financial advisor with us. Um, everyone, thanks for joining. And then last uh, but not least, certainly Colin Devlin. Colin, a big thank you to you. Uh, Colin is an attorney at Lexnova Law, specializing in estate planning and the taxation um, of estates just in general. Uh, Colin, thanks for joining us today and, and, and kicking off this discussion. Rory, my pleasure. I really appreciate you extending the offer and uh, I'm happy to be here today and uh, discuss estate planning with you. Exactly. Beautiful. So I'll kick this off and then uh, we'll just kind of go back and forth as we as we go through this topic. Uh, the necessary disclosures, as we all know, um, and having a state planning conversation with loved ones. So I want to take this route first to talk about having the conversation and the need to have the conversation with your family about your estate plan, or at least find out about the estate plan of some of your family members and the importance there. And then we're going to finish with uh, the components of an estate plan, wills, trusts, power of attorneys, and kind of dive into that. But first, and, and I'm excited to have this discussion with you, Colin, and get, get your examples or come some of your expertise, because most of our clients are baby boomers or they're millennials, high income millennials. And we know from the planning that we're doing with our, our clients that are baby boomers, those that have a good understanding of their parents, if they're still alive, and not only their parents' estate plan, but potentially their assets as well, is really powerful for developing your own plan. Um, there's been drastic changes to the retirement landscape. Now, inherited retirement accounts come with a 10-year distribution policy if it's a non-spouse beneficiary. So if you're inheriting a retirement account from your parents, you now have a 10-year distribution window that comes with taxable distributions. That might affect your retirement withdrawal strategy, taking money from retirement accounts versus non-retirement accounts. So knowing as if there's going to be maybe an inheritance involved, um, I think would be really helpful in developing your own plan or maybe getting an understanding of your parents and their plan, whether you need to help with increased costs due to aging or Medicare, medical planning. Um, do they have a long-term care policy? Do they have insurance? Um, do you need to help with the cost of some of those items? Um, then maybe there's just other items that you want to be aware of. If there's properties involved in multiple siblings, uh, Colin, I know we talked offline in preparation and you were sharing a story early in your career about the lack of having an estate plan or at least a comprehensive plan. Could you maybe kick off and share that example? Because I think that'd be great for everyone to uh, to hear. Sure, and we can we can touch on it more when we get to that specific topic. But uh, you know, we talked about um, the, the the topic of beneficiary designations and how that ties into one's estate plan. And I shared with Rory that uh, it was really an, an eye opening moment. Uh, I was you know it was the very beginning of my career. Uh, I was at uh, you know a prior firm that I worked at for several years prior to uh, to joining where I'm at now. But essentially, we had a, a, an estate plan for. For clients, uh, where we did, you know, fine planning, and there were three children, uh, and we had updated their estate plan uh, to provide equally for two of the three children. The third child had become estranged from their parents and hadn't spoken to the father in in twenty or twenty five years. Well, we learned when we met with the the son after the father died that there was a four hundred thousand dollar annuity that. Uh, was still designated the estranged son as the beneficiary. Hmm. And the estate itself was only worth maybe $600,000 uh, in addition to that $400,000. So the way it worked out is, you know, simple math that the two children who the parents intended to um, to provide for each ended up with $300,000. And the estranged child who they hadn't spoken to in 20 years down in Florida uh, you know, received the, the $400,000 annuity and ultimately the bulk of the estate. 
so, you wow. know, when we get to the beneficiary designation slide here, you know, Rory, I just think it really becomes important that that, you know, the beneficiary designations mirror our estate plans. Uh, yeah. And and everyone should play a role there, not just the the individuals, but also the family's trusted advisors. You know, whether it's the estate planning attorney or the wealth advisor, such as yourself, to make sure that that everyone is on the same page and that all of the T's are crossed and I's are dotted. Right, exactly right. Um, I mean, one thing is it's tough, and as this slide mentions, even some of the most open families, this can be a difficult conversation. Right, the, the room gets quiet when uh, the, the subjects of death and money arise and, and they kind of go hand in hand in regards to estate planning. But what I hope everyone understands today is that having the conversation is critical. Um, you're not going to be able to look back with regret. So you want to have that conversation now and maybe even to your point, um, revisit an estate plan uh, after several years and ensure that it is still facilitating your wishes and, and your desires. Um, so in regards to having the conversation, if it's an adult child, as I mentioned earlier, making sure your parents have their own plans. Um, and what if one of the parents becomes incapacitated? Uh, is there a, a plan in place to step in and make decisions for health purposes or make decisions for financial and investment assets uh, from a parent perspective? And this might go towards that other segment of clients that's growing rapidly with inside of our firm is the, the, the millennials and high income millennials that are now having children. Make sure that your children, you have guardians set up. So the event of your passing, there's a plan in place for who's going to take care of your children and how the, they can access the wealth that you've established at this point in time. Um, also, if you are that baby boomer client, we talked about having uh, aging parents. Maybe you have children now that are on and have begun their own careers and you want to incorporate them into the mix for some of these discussions. Um, you could be different. It's not all financial. Um, what if there's a secondary property? For a lot of clients in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, there's that shore house. Well, what if one of the children lives locally, but another child has moved out to California and wants nothing to do with uh, the, the shore house? Um, Colin, I'm sure you might have seen that. Is that something you can speak to or what would that family, if we're going off an example, want to maybe put in place or think about in regards to that specific situation? Sure. Uh, you touched on quite a few things there, but for that specific example, uh, where there's a shore house or maybe a, a sentimental property uh, that's involved that maybe only one of your children uses, it becomes really important to have that conversation uh, and to include, you know, all of the potential stakeholders uh and and your children that are involved there um you know using that example if there's a you know a, a child who goes down to the the avalon or ocean city new jersey property every weekend uh mm -hmm. there's probably an expectation that you know from the child's perspective that they should receive the home and two if the jersey shore is important to the family that the parents probably want that asset to stay within the family well what good does that do the child out in california or the, right. the child who, who hates the shore at death, they're going to want that property sold. I mean, we all know the price of real estate, especially coastal properties, are mm -hmm. through the roof right now. And, and many families may be, if not the most valuable asset, one of the most valuable assets they have. And as we know with real estate, you know, there's not always liquidity there to equalize distribution. So if child one, you know, wants to receive that million dollar property, is there a million dollars of other assets to make the other child whole? Or mm -hmm. are we now in a sticky situation where we may need to sell the property? Or mm -hmm. do we need to actually iron that out in the state planning document, whether it be a will or a trust, how to handle the property? Right. But obviously, it's better to handle that now rather than have no plan in place and then leave those siblings to kind of fight over the future decision. Um, so once again, that's the importance of having this conversation. To a lesser degree, grandparents, but maybe if you're a grandparent, you want to incorporate your your grandchildren or nieces and nephews into the, the plan um, rather than just the parents. And maybe you want to make your, or rather than just your children, and you might want to make your children aware of those wishes and desires of leaving certain assets or leaving legacy to your grandchildren or to those nieces and nephews. That can be difficult. Um, you know, not even if you're a grandparent. What if you just have extended family, nieces, nephews, brothers, sisters that you want to leave wealth to, um, depending upon what state you live in, there could be taxes and inheritance tax involved. But then also it could be difficult to understand, 
How do you incorporate their extended families? So thinking about this and developing a plan is, is really important. Um, but in that grandparent seat, you might want to have that discussion with your children, especially if you're involving the grandchildren to a degree. So how do we get this conversation started? Um, Colin, I don't know if you have any comments here, but in, in general, you want to think about it and you want to plan ahead. Um, certainly, we want to pick a, a positive environment. You want to be sincere about your in intentions um, and you want to stress. And I think this is the last point is critical that I'll, I'll have you kind of talk about, Colin, and share your experiences, but stress the importance and the benefits of having the conversation and who's going to be affected by having the estate plan, right? That you're taking a lot of the unknowns and a lot of the by chance situations out of the equation by having the discussion and developing a plan in place if a plan isn't in place or revisiting and making sure that that plan needs updating, whether it's changes to family dynamics or changes to taxes or state laws. Um, so Colin, what, what are your thoughts about the benefits of that conversation and what you've seen in your experience? Yeah, so first and foremost, the conversation is can obviously be challenging, right? Um, yeah. It can be awkward. Uh, in some families, it may be intimidating or intrusive. Uh, you know, especially with the older generation, I think that there's, uh, you know, oftentimes there the finance is just, hey, it's no one else's business. Uh, yeah. You know, sometimes even between a married couple with the older generations, you know, historically maybe you know there's there's been a breadwinner who's handled all the finances and the other spouse is kind of in the dark, uh, let alone children in the next generation. So I can certainly appreciate, you know, the hesitation to maybe have that talk. Um, with your parents, but the reality is the conversation, you know, needs to happen. Um, talking mm -hmm. openly, honestly, and frequently um, can really better prepare uh, for the financial future of everyone involved, not just, you know, your parents who may subsequently pass away, but even the next generation and setting expectations. Because um, the reality is there's no better time to have this conversation than now. Um, mm -hmm. As we've all learned, uh, you know, even over the past few years with COVID and other things, you know, life's just uncertain. Yeah. Uh, and it's really important to have those conversations before an event, whether that be death or incapacity. Because oftentimes, uh, if we haven't taken care of things, uh, you know, prior to one of those events happening, uh, it can really, you know, cause a mess on the backside of things. It can, right. you, know, uh, you know, it makes things certainly more costly, but now you're having conversations that, you know, you probably should have had, you know, while your parents were still living or able to make those decisions for yourself or, or yeah. maybe just explain what their what their their their, their thought process was. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, so let's talk about some do's and, and maybe provide some help in regards to uh, having these discussions. So as we lay out here, um, you might need to expect to have more than one conversation. It could take a few meetings to make progress, especially because you know, death and money are, are difficult subjects. So the, the first conversation might be just talking about how you want to have that conversation and how you might want to prepare for that as a family. Um, Colin, what about the next one? Think about who else should be involved. In your opinion, um, what should what should our clients be thinking about in regards to who else they might want involved in that initial and in few in, in, in future discussions? Yeah, in, in fact, I think number, and I don't know if this is set out in priority order, but if it was, I, I think number two should actually be number one after actually yeah. setting the time to have the conversation. Um, including other siblings or stakeholders is probably the most important thing you can do um, mm -hmm. to promote family harmony, uh, to avoid any distrust, and kind of establish that sense of fairness. Because, you know, what do they say? What's fair lies in the eyes of the beholder. Rory, yeah. what you might think is fair. I may disagree or vice versa. Um, and it's it's just it's really important um, so that, you know, you can avoid maybe any potential accusations of undue influence or coercion down the road. Um, mm -hmm. It can be, a you know, it can be really important to actually have these conversations in blended families, right? Oh, okay. You know, children from a prior marriage to establish a chain of command or or set realistic expectations. Um, you know, I touched on earlier, you know, I think we opened up with the, the example I had uh, with the estranged family member. It can be really delicate in a situation where there is an estranged member. And that's where it becomes more important or vital to encourage your parents to maybe meet with somebody independently, their trusted mm -hmm. advisors, to avoid in a potential estate litigation or will contest 
uh, some of those accusations, as I mentioned, whether it's coercion or undue influence, or maybe you know someone suggesting that the uh, the testator or the grantor of a trust had a you know a weakened mind or didn't have the mental capacity to make those decisions. Yeah. Um, if you worry that some of these conversations might escalate or become unpleasant, you know consider bringing in a, a third party to have those conversations, whether it's you know your wealth advisor, a tax professional, or an estate planning attorney. Um, wow. I think some parents avoid having these conversations because maybe they don't want to upset their children and maybe it's not about the distribution right i still intend to leave all of my assets equally to my children but i know i want my son to be my executor i know i want my daughter who's a nurse to be my health care power of attorney um so even in in the fiduciary selection process everyone having a, a an understanding in that discussion is just as important or if not as important as actually making distributions equally or unequally among your children or, or other beneficiaries. I agree. And as we're talking through this, I'm thinking there might need to be a conversation before the conversation, right? Where the siblings maybe have the discussion about talking to mom and dad, right? Or the parents have a conversation, uh, obviously amongst themselves and, and preparing ahead of time for who they're going to name the executor, who they're going to name as the guardian. Um, so there's probably some some discussions that need to happen before the, uh, in, the actual In, in kickoff. a perfect world, Rory, in the, the family that, that gets along and celebrates their Thanksgivings and Christmases together, that's yeah. always a great plan. But I, I think we all know that, that that's not always the case. Uh, but yeah, if, if that is, you know, if, if you have the ability to do that and you can, you know, give your brother a call or or shoot your sister an email, said, hey, you know, we should really have a talk to set up a plan to talk to mom and dad, you know, about their estate or about their long term care. I, yeah. I really think that is the way to go. I mean, I still remember to this day, my mother having a conversation with my uncle that was around the holidays. And it was, hey, I think we need to talk one on one about how long my grandparents were going to be able to stay in their house just with them getting older and aging and things of that nature. Um, so, you know, that was an example of that. That's kind of what I thought of as we were talking through this, that they kind of had that separate conversation of, hey, we need to get together and have a real conversation about, well, can 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 my grandparents stay in that house for, for X number of years moving forward with them slowing down and aging and things of that nature? Um, yeah, another thing we can, and it's such a... It's just it's it is it's really tough, a, a, a challenging conversation. Yeah, I mean, Rory, I, I I do it for a living, you know. But <laughs> who wants to talk with, with with their parents or loved ones about their mortality or or yeah. their deterioration? I mean, it it's, it can be unpleasant. Yeah, it certainly can. Uh, one thing that that I think makes it a little bit easier is you got to prepare. You want to stay on track. I'm sure these conversations can get off the rails. So preparing ahead of time, having a list of questions, and that's something that you can leverage us for, for, for yourself and for myself. I mean, what are some of those questions? How should we prepare? That's something that we can obviously help with. And then lastly, I think it goes without saying, you want to be gentle. Um, realize that this can be a difficult conversation for you and awkward for you to have and bring up and take that first step in addition to it being uh, difficult for, for your audience. So, so now, what do we not want to do? Um, so, uh, you know, one of these items is and maybe we don't want to bring up money, at least right away. We don't want to do this spontaneously. You know, after everyone's gotten together, there maybe there's been a few drinks, you know, you're staying around the kitchen island. That's not the time to have this conversation. Um, you, you want to likely do it, uh, you know, privately and not in public. Colin, what are some other maybe uh, tips to avoid uh, in regards to having this discussion? Yeah, well, I mean, you 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 bring up in that first uh, the first bullet point about about bringing up money um, that that you certainly don't want to um, uh, I guess present yourself in a way where it says, "Hey, Dad, how much am I getting on the day you die?" Okay, right. Yeah. So that would be the first thing. So then that ties into to being gentle, and maybe you can have that conversation or deliver the message in another way, right? Maybe it comes up, you know, as one of the topics. You know, when you ask, well, where is, do you, do you have estate planning documents? You know, where, where do you keep them? Where are the originals? Um, so, yeah, I, you know, and every family's different. You know, that's not a one size fits all. To the extent you can get a net worth statement from your mom or dad, that yeah. certainly makes, makes life easier. Um, you know, I think, I think one of the uh, uh, sayings that has really resonated with me, I had a, a client who inherited a substantial amount of money. And he said, the greatest gift my father gave me was an organized file of where everything was. And uh, it's something that has stuck with me th throughout my career. Yeah. Um, 
because you know may, maybe you you don't need to bring up the specifics of you know how much is in your IRA, how much life insurance you have, but to the extent that you can identify where all of the assets are, it can certainly make things you know a, a, a lot easier. Uh, in the that's event. a powerful yeah. So that's a powerful statement, right? The greatest gift is an organized file and inventory. Um, I think one thing that that I can share is we can help provide that and make that easier. So the through the financial planning, every client has their own specific client portal and there's a vault. That's one of the tabs. Inside of that vault are folders where you can create electronic files of documents. You can scan in the will, scan in your trust documents, put them in a file that you title estate plan. But now you have that in a secure location that's accessible uh, via website rather than you know stored away in a safe deposit box. In addition to that, the client portal allows for an inventory of assets. You can even connect outside accounts that get fed in on a daily basis. You have accuracy in terms of what those dollar figures are, or you can write in there's this property, you know, titled in this name, et cetera. Um, so all of our clients have access to that and, and we're trying to build that out. But I think that's something that we can offer up to our clients, parents or our clients, children to create and, and maybe provide them a client portal so that that organization process can be a little bit easier, but also more up to date. Um, so that's a great point, and, and I think that is a powerful statement that that, that was the greatest gift. Um, lastly on here, you know, don't have other distractions. Don't have, uh, you know, kids running around. Don't have the, the, the Thanksgiving football game on in the background. It really should be a focused discussion. Um, and as we rotate through, uh, we're going to talk about what some of those documents are, and it's obviously going to start with the will. But I'll leave this to, to you, Colin. Are there any you know, parting thoughts or, or anything that you would share in regards to the conversation process um, and what you've seen you know, going up, having conversations with parents, maybe going you know, down in the family tree and having conversations with children? Uh, any final thoughts for those listening? Yeah, sure. I, I think the next thing I would just touch on or, or close with with respect to, to that, that part of our, our discussion today is, OK, you've, you've, you've now... You've gotten your siblings together. You've now ironed out the, the, the date that you're going to sit down with mom and dad. And we know when we're going to have this conversation. Well, what topic should this conversation cover? Right. And first and foremost, I would, you know, I would ask, um, is there a current estate plan in place? Do mom and dad have a will? Do they have powers of attorney? Do they have a living will? Do they have a trust if, it's, if that's something that uh, may be beneficial to them? If they say yes, well, then the next question is, okay, well, are they up to date? You know, that's great. You have a will, but was was it prepared 20 years ago? Yeah. Um, the, the, the tax laws, both on the federal and state level, have drastically changed uh, over the years. Um, you know, tax reasons aside, do uh, do the documents still accurately accurately reflect your intentions and desires? Mm -hmm. Who are the fiduciaries? Who did you appoint as your executor? Maybe it's a, you know, a uh, a friend that you appointed 25 years ago who's either no longer living or they're up there in age and they don't want to take on that role or they're not capable of it. And I'm sure you've um, seen that, right? I'm sure you've seen that in your career where that changes time over time. Yeah. Absolutely. And then to the extent that they don't have an estate plan in place, what documents do they need? You know, the, the child should be familiar with the documents that are necessary to establish a sound estate plan. Um, That's right. You know, we touched briefly on, you know, what are their assets? Maybe we don't need to talk about this, the specific numbers uh, of what's in each account, but where are they located, right? I, I used to meet with executors in the beginning of my career where they, you know, they weren't sure if they had everything. You know what? I know mom has an IRA here. I know they own, you know, a, a couple of rental properties, but I'm really not sure what else is out there. We used to go say, okay, let's just wait a few weeks and we'll follow the paper trail. We'll see what statements come in. Yeah. Well, now, you know, 80 90 percent of the world everything's digital you know you, you you don't know what else is out there do you have right. mom and dad's you know is, is there a you know a a letter of instruction that has all of mom and dad's passwords to their different accounts um so for families that may be more sensitive about the specific numbers just just being able to wrap your arms around uh everything and, and knowing where the different assets are located and how they're titled um and then the other thing the thing is you know lifetime planning, right? Do mom and dad have ample assets to, to, to in the event that they need long-term care or, or yeah. you know, do, do they have the resources to pay for that? 
you know, that could also provide, Rory, you mentioned on it earlier, you know, going the other way from, from parent to, to child, you know, could that, you know, provide a sense of calm for a child say, okay, mom and dad have plenty of assets, you know, I'm not going to have to dip into my own funds to make sure they're taking care right. of Right. Yeah, absolutely. And then, and then, and then lastly, I, you know, I'd probably find out who their trusted advisors are. If they did have an, uh, an estate plan prepared, who was their estate planning attorney? Is that firm still in business, right? Mm -hmm. Who's their wealth advisor? Where where do they they have their IRA? Uh, to the extent that they have a CPA or a trusted tax professional, you know who 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 are my centers of influence? Who's going to help me? You know, settle my parents' affairs. Who can help me consolidate things to make life easier? Yeah, the consolidation is key. Uh, I, I know we've done that several times for clients that have uh, introduced us to their parents, and I saw it with my grandparents. You know, my grandparents had three different bank accounts, four different annuities. It was kind of all over the place. Um, so consolidating can make life a lot easier because you can you can do that with a, an individual that's still alive, right? And can sign those documents compared to having to unwind that or sift through that after the fact. And it's a lot more difficult to try to consolidate or even process uh, an estate. I'm sure as, as you know, if there's, three different financial institutions involved, four different insurance companies, and you have outdated documents. So I think that's great. And I think it's a great segue into, you know, what we're going to kind of go a little bit quickly through, uh, but that is, you know, what are the components of an, of an estate plan? Um, I like that, that mention of some of those questions. And I think that could be a good follow-up for those listening. You know, feel free to reach out to, to me and I can connect with you, Colin, about what those list of questions are to provide to those listening to maybe start that conversation. I think that that could be the starting point. I so agree. back to the, the PowerPoint here and back to the presentation, um, you know, what is a will? And, you know, th this is the most widely known estate planning document. Um, what if you don't have a will? Let's just go there uh, before we go off. So what if an individual passes away without a will? Um, what takes place and what are the downsides uh, behind that? Because um, I'm sure some listening don't have any estate plan and that includes not even having a will. So Colin, what happens if there's no will and an individual passes away? Sure, so when an individual passes away without a will, they're, the, the, the term that's used is they're treated as having died in test state. And each state has different intestacy laws. Uh, you know, generally, uh, if there's a surviving spouse, in most situations, most states, all of the assets will go to the surviving spouse uh, and then, you know, followed by by children. Um, if in second marriage situations, uh, for example, Pennsylvania and in New Jersey are much different um, where uh, the allocation, you know, may be, I think that in New Jersey, the spouse gets the first 25 percent of the estate, but not less mm -hmm. than 50,000 or more than 200,000 and then everything gets split equally. In Pennsylvania, there isn't that initial threshold uh, and the assets just get split equally. Um, but essentially, if you die without a will, you're, you're potentially letting the state governor dictate where your assets titled in your individual name are gonna go. And yeah. then, you know, finances aside, it also, the, the, the state and testacy laws will establish the pecking order of who uh, has priority to serve as administrator of your estate. So, you know, maybe you, you have three or four kids, you don't have a will, all four kids have the right to serve as the administrator. And it's the classic case of, okay, now I may have two chef, too many chefs in the kitchen. Right. Um, you know, you may have children who either just don't get along, don't trust each other. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a bunch of different, you know, things that, that could go wrong in that situation, as I'm sure everyone can imagine. Yeah, and then yeah. The, the other, and then the other issue is that it it just makes things much more costly. Um, instead mm. of you know just going over the surrogate in New Jersey, you have to wait ten days. But instead of just going over the surrogate on the eleventh day, after you know mom or dad has passed this and presenting the will and becoming appointed as executor, in this situation it can take weeks or even months to get somebody appointed. Wow. Uh, you have to pay an administrator's bond to an insurance company. Um, it just makes things much more costly and time consuming. And instead of an estate being settled, you know, expeditiously and, uh, you know, ironing everything out and laying the foundation for the family, uh, it, it can create a lot of hiccups and, and cause a lot of hoops to uh, be jumped through. 
That's great. Thanks for for sharing that with us. Um, when we were talking and prepping for this discussion, um, you had mentioned that you have clients come to you with just a will, and many times they end up drafting trust. Uh, why would that be the case? And what's your opinion of of, of trust just in, incorporating and utilized in an estate plan? Because um, I think trust is is almost a term that is intimidating to, to, to most. Many individuals think that they don't have the assets for a trust. So what's the main difference between a will and trust? And why do you see some of your clients come in with a basic will, but then determine that they want to actually set up and establish trust? Sure. So th there is, you touched on a little bit, Roy, there, there's this misnomer, misconception out there that, that trusts are only necessary for extremely wealthy people. Uh, and the reality of it, it it's it, that's just not true. While there's certainly financial and tax considerations uh, when creating a trust, there's really more non-tax and non-financial considerations uh, when trying to determine whether you need a trust. Mm -hmm. um, you know, most importantly for asset protection purposes, right? Uh, to making sure that assets stay in the family bloodlines. Uh, unfortunately, maybe you lose a child at a young age, they predecease you, or maybe you leave assets to them, but then they subsequently pass away and they have a will that just leaves everything to their spouse uh, or maybe they took those assets and immediately put them in a joint account and they pass away maybe at a young age and their spouse receives all those assets spouse goes and remarries now all the assets you left to your child are now essentially with an entirely different family mm. um exposing those assets to equitable distribution maybe if a child you know is uh, gets divorced um spendthrift protection maybe you have a child who you know has significant credit card debt or just doesn't you know have good financial acumen um maybe you have a child or grandchild that has drug or substance abuse issues and you want to make sure that 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 money is protected um and you those know, are, yeah those are great great examples um to, to kind of think through i think the other point on trust that that i'd like you to touch on is the difference between a revocable trust in an irrevocable trust. I think that's pretty unknown as well. Uh, just maybe a brief uh, difference between the two and how you incorporate uh, you know, one or both of those in your estate planning with your clients. Sure, so with a, a revocable trust, oftentimes we, uh, that becomes the, the, the will substitute, I'll call it. And it kind of serves as the, the vehicle that receives all of your assets at your death, whether that's a pour over will where assets passing through your will pass over to your revocable trust or your revocable trust is named as the beneficiary of certain assets whether that be mm -hmm. life insurance or retirement accounts or maybe you move a property that you have uh down in florida like for example a state such as florida all of your assets if you if you have any florida assets or you think that you may now or in the future become a florida resident it becomes absolutely critical that you put all of your assets into a revocable trust to wow, avoid probate. Really? Yes, the Florida is the worst probate state in the country by far. Uh, mm. I can use an example. We have a client, we've been working on this estate for two years now. Uh, they had no Marriott way. timeshares down in Florida that might be worth $100 each. We've spent about $25,000 in legal fees and probate fees down in Florida just to transfer three Marriott timeshares. Oh and they my simply goodness. just had a trust. They already had, they actually had the revocable trust created by another attorney, but they didn't move those assets into the revocable trust. Had they just moved those assets, those timeshares into a revocable trust down in Florida, they would have avoided all of the probate and legal fees associated with it. Now, real quick, stay with that. How do you move assets into a trust? It depends on the asset. So for example, if you were actually gonna move assets into the trust during your lifetime, it would be, you know, for example, for real estate, it would be as simple as just transferring the deed over to the revocable trust. If it was a bank account or a broker's account, you would just change the titling on the account from, you know, Roy O'Hara individually to the Roy O'Hara Revocable Living Trust. If the trust is really just to kind of serve as the bucket to collect all of your assets at your death for ultimate distribution to your beneficiaries, then the titling of your assets would remain the same in your individual name but you would just name the revocable trust as your beneficiary. Um, Got it. So that's pretty much for the revocable trust planning. The, the irrevocable trust is usually created for asset protection or, uh, or, or federal estate tax planning uh, and taking advantage of the federal estate tax exemption by making gifts to an irrevocable trust uh, while still 
having either potentially you or your family as beneficiaries during your lifetime. Um, you know, I, I, I generally don't do elder law, but oftentimes you'll see a Medicaid irrevocable trust where you'll move the, uh, the, the family's residence into an irrevocable trust to start the five year clock so that it doesn't become subject to a clawback uh, from, from Medicaid. Um, you think you might see irrevocable trust pick up with the year 2026 and estate tax exemptions coming down? Yeah, you know, so, so that, irrevocable trust planning, especially with life insurance, uh, yeah. You know, I'm sure you're familiar with the irrevocable life insurance trust, but irrevocable trusts were extremely popular and they, and they still are, but even more popular up until uh, the, the, the Trump administration, uh, where Washington, D.C. effectively doubled the estate tax exemption rates um, under under Donald Trump. And they right. essentially jumped from five million uh, up to 10 million while he's in office and now as adjusted for inflation. Each individual has a federal estate tax exemption of almost $13 million right now. But as Rory touched on, those numbers are due to sunset back to the pre-Trump levels on January 1 of 2026. Uh, and um, yeah, that's so those where, wealthy you know, families um, really should be looking at some estate planning if you think your wealth can be approaching and exceeding the five, $10 million you know, range. And, Many people may not be there now, but it's the future growth that can be important and, and utilizing a trust and putting assets into that trust so that future growth is out of the estate if held inside of the irrevocable is some planning to think about. And, and I would utilize this as an opportunity prior to 2026 to you know, start a gifting strategy or create some of those trusts and retitle those assets. So that's great. Yes, right. Just to build off that, as Rory explained, it, it is a, a use it or lose it provision. Right. right. So if you are above, uh, you know, if you're in that gray area where you're, you know, above, you know, six, eight million, maybe you're not worried about that 13 million dollar exemption right now. Uh, but to the extent that comes back, you could have taken advantage of, of that 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 enhanced exemption up until 2026 and gotten those assets out of your estate. So not only did you maybe get an excess two or four million out of your estate, prior to 2026, but over 20 years, if that grows to 10, 12, 15 million, well, no, that's all out of your estate. And, you know, I, I think sometimes when people hear irrevocable trust, they, uh, there's a, an alarm or a concern that, well, um, I, I'm no longer retaining control of any of my assets. Well, there's creative trust that, that can be established such that they're created for the, the benefit of, of your family, and you'll either directly or indirectly have access to those assets. So something to, to consider if you think that might apply to you. No, that's great. Great to add that. Um, we talked about it before, beneficiary designations. Now at Austerity, we, we try to uh, assist with that. Uh, all of our clients have beneficiary designations. We do a campaign once a year uh, and try to reach out to those clients that might have established a new retirement account but did not add a beneficiary designation. Uh, assets are gonna pass not per will if there's a beneficiary designation involved. And many of that's going to be retirement and insurance insurance assets are going to pass per that beneficiary designation. So it's important to not only, you know, utilize those and, and create the beneficiary designation, but to your first story to then revisit and ensure that that is still valid and those are still your wishes. Um, just like if we pass away without a will, Colin, talk about this last part. What if you don't name a beneficiary and pass away? Uh, the distribution of that insurance policy or that retirement account. Uh, can you take us through that? Yeah, sure. So, so just to to uh, double down what Rory said, it, it's vital to make sure that your beneficiary designations mirror your estate plan. Uh, and to the extent that a, a beneficiary isn't named or a beneficiary is deceased, well, generally the financial institution's policy would then control, right? So. Um, you know, if you, if you had the uh, account with with Maverick Partners uh, and uh, or um, Austerity or, or wherever your, your account is um, um, or MetLife, if you don't have it named, well, then you're relying on you're relying on the institution to kind of dictate where those assets go per their per their company policy. And then to the extent they say, well, it's going to pass to the estate if nobody is named and you don't have a will. Well, now you're relying on state law and the intestacy laws that I touched on earlier. Uh, and then even in some scenarios, you know, that I've seen is maybe a, 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 um, a court or a judge could be left to interpret what the, 
decedent's intent was. Maybe there was a deathbed transfer, right? And what I mean by a deathbed transfer is maybe the beneficiary was changed three days before they died. Mm -hmm. And the previous beneficiary comes in and challenges and says, wait a second, my mom had dementia. She couldn't have done that herself. Uh, so there's, there's, there's a myriad of reasons of why it's imp important to make sure that your beneficiary designations are, are certainly up to date. And That's the last thing I'll add is having a beneficiary designation on, a, on an account, the extent your beneficiaries may need money right away to maybe whether it's pay for a funeral or they just need access to funds, uh, they avoid the probate process and there's could become immediate funds available whether it be in a trust or, you know, if they're designated directly to the individual, uh, that generally wouldn't be available until the estate's been been probated or opened. Yeah, and just to clarify, uh, our clients at uh, Asperity here, Fidelity is our custodian. So it's not Asperity uh, making the policy or making the statement. It would be Fidelity, which is the custodian that, that we use, uh, just to clarify that further. Uh, another important document, uh, Colin, is the power of attorney. Briefly, uh, power of attorney and its use, and then we'll get into kind of the healthcare directive as we start to finish off. So, um, just talk us through very, very briefly uh, the use of a power of attorney and why uh, that is a vital part of uh, estate planning for you and your clients. Sure. So, up till now, we 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 discussed in depth the will and you know potentially trust that would really come into governance at at one's death, where the power of attorney is the document you know, the powerful document that actually controls during lifetime and seizes at death. Mm -hmm. But prior to to an individual's death, if they're in a position where they're unable to make decisions for themselves, uh, you can appoint an agent under a power of attorney who can make the important decisions in your life. So generally, we'll see a general durable power of attorney, which will appoint an agent to make financial business and perhaps real estate decisions on your behalf. You know, maybe someone needs to to speak with Rory or someone at his team about, you know, assets in, in you know, a parent's account. Or maybe there's uh, a rental property that the mom or dad was the landlord of and, you know, they're now incapacitated and, you know, there's uh, landlord tenant issues that, that have arisen or need to collect rent. Or maybe there's business decisions. Maybe there's a family business and the operating agreement doesn't outline who's next in line and someone needs to, to step in to make those decisions. Yeah, and then, or even what, what we've seen is maybe one spouse has got significantly more assets in the form of retirement funds and becomes incapacitated. We can't take direction from the other spouse to do distributions and things of that nature unless there's a power of attorney on file and, and that was granted to the spouse. You know, retirement accounts are individual based. We can't take direction from anyone for distribution or investment changes other than that individual. Um, so as you get older, I think this is stuff you got to think about. Yes, and then uh, and then there's also a healthcare power of attorney. Sometimes the one power of attorney governs all of the documents, but you know I know at my firm we we separate the documents. Uh, and the healthcare power of attorney, as you can imagine, deals with medical decisions. The person who yeah. can correspond with your doctors and other health professionals uh, or make decisions related to your health. Usually they'll contain a HIPAA provision that will permit the uh, the medical facility to release you know confidential documents that they otherwise couldn't release to you uh, without that language in a healthcare power of attorney. Great, super, Colin. Thank you. And then then moving on for uh, for myself and and for you who have you know young children, uh, choosing a guardian is is very important. Um, I'm sure this is often not done, uh, you know, as frequently as it, as it should be. Um, having a child is a need to maybe start and begin and, and draft an estate plan. Um, so, Colin, you know, talk about guardianship a bit. Sure. So, so the, generally, the, the the guardian is named uh, in the will to come full circle here, uh, and this necessarily might not be the difficult topic uh, or discussion to have with your parent, but rather your spouse. Um, I, yes. I generally see, you know, when I meet with married couples, especially with with young children, uh, they're not always in line on who the guardian would be in, you know, the remote or unlikely event that both spouses passed away before a child reached age 18. Uh, you know, a lot of times the husband wants somebody from his side of the family and the, the wife wants somebody from her side of the family. So it's really important that husband and wife or, or, um, or you know, uh, any, any partners um, are aligned on who they'd want to be the guardian uh, to be for their children because the extent they're not and they choose different people 
Well, then it's essentially whoever survives, their will is going to be the one that controls. Right. Yeah. And, and following up on that, after you name a guardian or even before having the conversation with the potential guardian and letting them know, hey, you know, we're looking to name you. Is that something that you're comfortable with? Um, that's a pretty powerful, you know, privilege and it, it, that can be a lot. So, again, we're talking about having these conversations. Uh, that's a conversation that uh, you want to think about and have, you know, before maybe even putting this in place, too. Yeah. And the, and the other thing I'll touch on that's a, another component to think about when choosing a guardian. It's usually pretty obvious when a, a, a child or your children are young, right? Two, four, six, even eight years old. But it can be a tough conversation or, or something to really consider is, now all of a sudden your child's 13 or 14 and they've been in a certain school system for eight, 10 years and yeah. all of their friends are in Morristown, New Jersey. And the guardian that you choose is, you know, a, a, a sibling who's maybe in another school district or perhaps even in another state. Well, maybe it might be time to think about updating the guardian. Is there a friend or, or somebody, a neighbor who, a you know, point. I'm, I'm going to name them as the guardian so my kid can finish high school with his friends. No. Um, so it, the, the guardian is a unique situation and that's where a lot of times you'll tie that in to estate and trust planning because sometimes the guardian may just be your trustee, but oftentimes you work with your trustee and your guardian and says, Hey, you know, my son, my son, Bobby's going to go down the street and live with a neighbor, but I want to make sure my trustees give an X amount per month to the guardian to make sure that he's taken care of. Yeah, no, that's a great point. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, also, this is a little bit less known, uh, a letter of intent, um, you know, essentially just uh, helping with some of the information. Uh, do you utilize the letter of intent? Do you see it commonly utilized? What are some of the benefits of uh, adding a letter of intent as a part of uh, an estate plan? Yeah, so we, we do have a, a letter of instruction, which sometimes we'll include. Um, we don't always, it, you know, it's, it's certainly a non-binding document, mm -hmm. but you know, to the extent we can, you know, kind of share a template uh, or some type of, you know, we've actually done a family constitution for clients uh, mm. that basically sets out what the the patriarchs, you know, desires are and kind of leaves it in the hands of the kids, but says, hey, you know, th th this is what I want. These are these are my desires and it's on them to carry it out. Um, right. But yeah, to, to your extent, I mean, we kind of touched on a lot of this with the financial and digital information kind of, uh, you know, having that 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 document or that binder in place that has everything set out where all of the assets are what my usernames and passwords are essentially you know if that rainy day comes you know here's where everything is and here's all the yeah. information you need helps with organization helps with if you have you know a desire for your funeral or for readings to be said during your funeral and things of that nature so uh, i definitely think it helps we with just we just put together a uh, uh essentially essentially a memorandum or a, a funeral direction where the the woman wants the the giuliano brothers to play at <laughs> you know it used to be the springfield which i think just closed and then afterwards once all our ashes dumped in you know the ocean down in sea isle so <laughs> You, know, you can get as creative as you want there. Yeah, but if that's what you want, you got to document it. You got to have that conversation. And I think that brings us to, uh, you know, the end of this this presentation. Um, hopefully the takeaways are a little assistance on how to have the conversation, but more importantly, why it's critical to have that conversation. And think about your own family tree. Is that having the discussion with your parents? Is it having the discussion with children? Is it having it with siblings, nieces and nephews? You know, the critical component is having it. But guys, it's not it's probably not going to be easy and it may not. It might be a little bit awkward. So hopefully we gave you a few takeaways um, that can help kind of get that process moving. And then also rounding out the discussion was uh, what is an estate plan? What are some of those documents? What are differences? And I always kind of like to, to kind of do examples of, well, what if I don't do this? What are the repercussions? Um, and in Colin's case, I think you shared a number of great examples and, and costs, especially that Florida example of uh, the, the amount of costs and, and years it's taken to uh, finish that estate just because of the probate process in Florida. I think that that's great information. So um, for everyone that tuned in, thank you very, very much. Colin, thank you for your time. Um, I know uh, we've worked on, on several clients together. They've all been very appreciative and helpful, and uh, it, it's great to have these discussions. So thanks for your time. I really appreciate it. It was great having you on.
and uh, we'll talk to you soon. My pleasure, Rory. Appreciate you and uh, and your whole team over there, and uh, look forward to uh, working uh, into the future with you all. Absolutely. All right, everyone. Have a great rest of the week. Take care. Thank you for watching our video. Please remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Look at our links below for ways of getting in contact with us and message us if you'd like us to add you to our monthly newsletter.